Good morning and welcome to the Lincoln Road Chapel online meeting for the 11th of October. We seem to have been producing these for quite some time now and frankly I think we'll be doing it for a fair while yet to come. Um, and who knows, maybe even when things return to something approaching normality, uh, we will continue with some kind of online presence. Who knows? As those of you who tune in to our Wednesday Zoom meetings will know, we have been looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians. And one of the many phrases that caught my attention from that letter is in chapter 2 and verse 15, when Paul tells the Philippian Christians that they are to shine as lights to the world. Now, obviously lights are incredibly useful. Um, where would we be without them? They're, they're used as a guide uh, or as a warning. Uh, they are used to bring cheer. I'm sort of thinking of Christmas lights, but literally they, they brighten things up. Um, or they make something safe when it would otherwise be dangerous. They reveal what would otherwise be hidden. And true Christians, true disciples, they are lights. Christ has said as much. So the only question really is how brightly do we shine? And I was struck by two things in the surrounding verses of what Paul said. In the preceding verse, verse 14, Paul tells us one of the secrets, probably the great secret, apparently, to being a light. And it is simply this, to do everything without complaining and without arguing. Now, that doesn't seem very complex to me. It doesn't seem very spiritual, in fact, very practical. But there it is. It's what he says. And in the verse after, Paul tells us the purpose of being lights, namely that we might hold out the word of life to people. And if you think about it, those two things very much go together. To hold out the word of life to people whilst you're arguing and bickering and complaining, that's not going to work, is it? But likewise, being some kind of wonderful shining example, but one that isn't holding out the word of life, Ultimately, that's just pointless. It's also true, a little trite perhaps, but true nonetheless, that lights are at their brightest when everything around is dark. And it seems to me, uh, and I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again, it seems to me that we live in unprecedented times, yes, but also unprecedented times of opportunity. Opportunity to not complain and, and, and bicker and argue when, frankly, all around us that seems to be the popular thing to do. Opportunity to shine in dark times. Opportunity to hold out the gospel, the word of truth, to people who are searching for purpose and for meaning. And that's what we'll be doing for the next hour or so in this meeting and I'm glad you could join us. To start with I will lead us in prayer. Father God we thank you for another opportunity to gather round your throne of grace and we would remember those just name them who have particular needs at this time. Uh, we think of Lily, uh, of Anne Smith, of Doug, of uh, Helen, of Rosemary in Australia, or of Moira. Uh, think of Carol. And we think of Norman Staples. Their needs are known to you, and we just bring them before your throne right now. Praying, believing, you will bless them. Thank you that you know the needs of each one of us, wherever and whenever we are. And that because of that, you can mete out a blessing that is fit just for our situation. A word of comfort, a word of encouragement, a word of challenge. Pray that you would do that in this next hour. We thank you 
that we have opportunities, uh, that we can shine, that we can hold out your word of life. Pray that you would help us to do that right now. For we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're going to start, continue really, by reading from Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 1 to 23, which is all of Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glory and grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Praise be to God. is my reward and all of my devotion now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free
this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing. Jesus is here. To God be the glory. Everyone, and it's time now for our children's talk today and the first question I've got is a quiz question for you this is it how many kings and queens are there in the world today do you think it's 13 56 or 25 I'll give you a few minutes few seconds to call out one of those numbers 13 56 or 25 what do you think well, the answer is 25. Well done if you got that one right. And here are three of them. The first one, the man standing in front of a flag, is King Harold. Now, do you know which country he is king of? He is king of... He's king of Norway. The second one, the man in the uniform, looking as if he's in the army or the navy, is King Gustav. And what country do you think he's king of? King of... He's king of Sweden. And finally, the man with the blue tie on, on the right-hand side, is King Philippe of... Where do you think? He is king of Spain. Well done if you got those answers correct. Like these men we've just looked at, Jesus is also a king. He rules over God's kingdom. But you can't find Jesus' kingdom on a map. God's kingdom is made up of people who have made him their king and who are sorry for their sins, that is, the wrong things they've done which he doesn't want them to do. God's kingdom includes people from every country and from long, long ago, right up to today. And there are still more people to come into his kingdom in the future, even people who haven't been born yet. When Jesus taught us how to pray to God, he said, do you remember? We should first say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That is, Call God Father and pray that people would treat his name as special. And then he said, we should pray, your kingdom come. Now I wonder what that means, your kingdom come. It means asking God to be king. I want you to think back to our family church just a week or so ago. Now, you might not have watched that, but if you didn't, you can go to the Lincoln Robe YouTube website 
and you can see the family church program and we made a heart like this and the heart the word heart has two different meanings the first meaning of the word heart is when it describes the heart in our body that pumps all through our lives and sends blood all around our body to our ears, to our eyes, to our brain, to our mouth, to our hands and to our feet. That's the first meaning of the word heart. So that's one meaning of what the word heart is. But another meaning is a person, what a person's really like inside. When you get right inside them, what they think, how they speak, what their actions are like, and what makes that all happen inside. We sometimes speak of a kind-hearted person, meaning they think kindly, they speak kindly, and they do kind things. I wonder what a hard-hearted person is like. Well, in that heart that we're thinking about, we're praying that God's kingdom would come. If we thought of our heart like this, it's as if we've got a throne in our heart. And some people, for some people, they're on the throne of their heart. They decide what they're going to do and they're not worried about what other people think and they're particularly, they don't want God to tell them what to do. But the person who wants God's kingdom to come gets off the throne of their heart and they put God on the throne and they follow what he wants to do. That's when God's kingdom comes in our lives and it changes our lives and it makes us live in a different way. The second part of asking for God's kingdom to come is we pray that other people, perhaps who we know or who we don't know, people in this country, people across the world, will come to know God's kingdom, that they will have God ruling in their hearts. And the third meaning is that we are praying that Jesus will return and gather together all the people who've made him king of their hearts into a new heaven and a new earth where we will live with him in his rule forever. So remember that when we pray, your kingdom come. Sending us his own son, Jesus died for us. God showed us his love when Jesus died for us. While we were his enemies, God showed us his love. How do we know what? Is God showed us his love By sending us his own son Jesus died for us God showed us his love When Jesus died for us While we were his enemies God showed us his love While we were lost His love by sending us his own son, Jesus died for us. God showed us his love when Jesus died for us. 
Welcome to our, I think it's the 30th uh, meeting since these lockdown restrictions began uh, for the 4th of October, Sunday the 4th of October, that's when we are recording for, as it were. Somebody rang me this morning to say that he had been very blessed by uh, the meeting. I think it was, I don't know what the subject was, but it was, I think the first one in June, he just uh, watched it on a DVD, I think it was, and um, I said to him, rather assuming, just a bit proud on my part, I kind of, oh, I can't remember what my subject was then, or something like that, assuming it was what I'd said that had been this blessing. Oh, he said, no, it was the whole thing being tactful, meaning it wasn't just you. And that's right. The whole, everybody who takes part, gives a testimony, in some way contributes, is doing just that. The word of God is the truth that we need to be saved. But when you hear it either through a children's spot or somebody's giving a testimony, that what they're saying is it's worked for me. So it is the word of God in that sense. But anyway, when we sing, we should sing the truth of the word of God, which is the Bible, one of the things the Bible says. Enough of that. 
Uh, subject this morning is a wonderful one, in Christ, a phrase that Paul especially uses. And I'm going to really be talking about the way he uses it and similar phrases in him, in the Lord, maybe I might be referring to that one um, as well, meaning in the person of God, the Son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, God who became a man in Christ. Not necessarily, well, not in fact, in this phrase, the, the physical location. We're not in him in that sense. That would be a bit odd. It, it, it has a spiritual meaning. But like Noah entered the ark and it was his salvation and the rain that beat upon him, which killed others who were not in the ark, but just lifted him above the judgment and so on. In that sense, we are in Christ. So all the protection, blessing of being the son of God and all that that means in terms of relationship. And in so many ways, we are in him and enjoy that because we have gone into the ark, not because we deserve anything, but because we've a listen to the call of God and have gone into Christ uh, and we discover that actually he put us there we'll look at that as we go along so three three headings firstly the examples of its meaning secondly growing into it into what it means to be in Christ and thirdly the point of entry entering that situation of being in Christ. The last two points are much briefer than the first. So examples of what it means. We have been chosen in him, in Christ. Ephesians chapter one, which I believe was read to you, verses three and four, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul says, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love it is not that i deserve anything god chose me in christ god cannot choose anybody apart from in christ what what choose me to be his friend with him forever and so on as a sinner? No, it has to be in Christ who is the saviour. And in fact, before I even existed, before the world was even created, certainly before it all went wrong, then I was chosen in him. In fact, the Bible speaks of the lamb, the Lord Jesus who had died, but now alive. <clears throat> the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So, well, God chooses. Well, if he chooses some, he hasn't chosen others. Well, Yes, but he chooses on the basis of his character. And his character is love and fairness. So it's right. Whatever he chooses is right. Uh, secondly, redemption and forgiveness in him. Chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In whom? In other words, in him, in Christ Jesus, as we read the verse before. Redemption. We have been, it's like the picture is the slave in the slave market. He cannot escape. He may want to. He may be resigned to it. But he's there. And I'm sold under sin. I'm a slave to sin. It's in my nature. It's not just that I do some things that are wrong, it's that I am a sinner. And Christ comes with the ransom price, the price that can free me, which is his blood. He pays that ransom price and I'm set free. Set free to serve God, free from the power of sin, the devil and so on. Free to come into God's presence and serve him. That's the idea of New Testament redemption. Then he says the forgiveness of sins. Everything that I've done that is wrong, I've broken God's law. Every time I've done that, including in my thinking and including in the things that I should have done that I didn't, I owe God for that. It's like a debt and that's paid. Christ has paid the debt, his own life, his own blood. He's taken my sin and that is how I can be loosed 
My sins are remitted. They're sent away. I am forgiven. Redemption and forgiveness, but it's in him, in Christ. A new creation in Christ. Popping over to chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, the workmanship of God, the workmanship of Christ, created in Christ Jesus to good works, things that we could never do before. Can't talk about the nature of it, there's not time for that. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Those are, those are wonderful things. At the end of the first creation, first day, second day, at the end of day six, God saw a perfect man in his image, in a perfect environment, and he said, very good. Not just good, but very good. It's finished, it's perfected. That creation was to be spoiled by sin, and then God cursed the creation in order to make people realize their need and so on and bring them to Christ basically but this is the new creation I'm now created in Christ Jesus if anyone be in Christ Paul says elsewhere 1 Corinthians 5 2 Corinthians 5 17 he is a new creation one that will not go wrong one that will not be subject to sin and will not be just destroyed, no law of entropy that will bring it to naught or anything like that. It is the new creation. Jesus was a carpenter, inherited that job from his earthly father. One could imagine, couldn't imagine him doing any job that wasn't properly done, finished. And, and, and this is his work. He's uniquely able to do it as God and man, having died but now alive, and we are part of that if we are in Christ, created in Christ Jesus. Unity in Christ is another. Chapter 1, again, of Ephesians and verse 10. That, I'm just breaking into the sentence, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he, God, may gather together in one all things or people in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in the earth, even in him. Think of the disunity on earth, the conflict between nations, between cultures, between genders, between different ideologies and, and so on and so forth. And that's just, just us. Then there's a bigger conflict than anything we see on earth and what dreadful conflicts there have been and there are now. The conflict between heaven and earth. That's bigger. And all that has been dealt with. We're gathered together in one, in Christ. In one experience, in one purpose. Even the Jew and the Gentile, if I can put it that way. The Jew was the chosen people at that time. God's special people that he used to illustrate his goodness to others. That was the plan. It didn't always work. Chapter 2 and verses 15 to 18 we read that God has reconciled the Jew and the Gentile together. They were, they were all sorts of reasons why they were not one. One of them was that all the paraphernalia laws that the Jew had to keep that the Gentile didn't have to keep. To keep. And um, they all pointed to Christ. Well, now they have been done away because Christ has fulfilled them. And the reality of, the, reality of what they stood for are being, is being fulfilled in God's people so that they're done away. So they've been nailed to his cross, taken out of the way. Our brother Colin Compton said something about that fairly recently. And so I'll read you uh, verse 15 of chapter 2 and on a bit. Um, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity between Jew and Gentile, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, I've just referred to those, for to make in himself of two one new man. So making peace, peace between Jew and Gentile. And that he might, uh, sorry, verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you that were afar off, that's the Gentiles, and to those who were near. They were near in the sense of they were God's chosen people. They weren't near in their hearts because they were sinners like the Gentiles. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So it's in Christ that there's this unity between the chosen people and every other race on earth. Unity between themselves and a unity with God. Jesus said there will be one flock, one fold, one shepherd. 
uh, eternal peace with each other and with God. That's in Christ. An inheritance is another thing available in Christ. Verse chapter 1 and verse 11, just the beginning of it. In whom, this is talking about Christ from the previous verse, we can see that. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Well, we know what an inheritance is, something that comes to us. It really has the idea of something by lot, rather like the Israelites were had their land that they had to conquer, divided up. And this is this for this tribe, this is for this tribe. And the psalmist said, my lot has fallen in pleasant places, my line, my boundary where I live, and so on and so forth. That's the idea. Something that we don't earn or deserve just comes to us. And that's exactly uh, the inheritance of God. And it, 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 all that we just come into through him. And we get a clue, it's in verse 18 here, it speaks of his inheritance among the saints. The saints are the holy ones, the ones saved from the earth and made like him, free from sin, devoted only to him, separated to him. And we're in that. That's the inheritance of God and it's our inheritance. Now often an inheritance comes to a person after the death of somebody. That doesn't necessarily, it's not included in the word here, but it's certainly true. Um, both God's inheritance and ours is because somebody died. The Lord Jesus died to take away our sin. And because he's died and risen, and he's the executor of, as it were, the will, and, and it's the inheritance comes to Christian Christians. Not that they deserve it wonderful uh, thing that is in Christ near to God that's another one I'm going to read you chapter 2 and verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus you who were sometimes afar off that refers to the Gentiles are made near by the blood of Christ the life of Christ poured out for our sins uh, near to God near geographically well in, in that sense we draw near to the throne of grace but it's not really geography it, it means relationship um, the barrier has gone and our interests are now similar and my interests are becoming more and more as he works in me what he's interested in pure things good things lasting things satisfying things pure wonderful loving things I'm going to read you a verse from the hymn by Catsby Paget. So nigh, so near, so very nigh, near to God. I cannot nearer be, for in the person of his Son, I am as near as he. The Son, even on earth, was in the presence of God, and now he's in heaven itself, and I'm in him. With his love and cares, becoming mine, near to God, in Christ. And summing all of that up, verse 3 of chapter 1, which I have referred to already, but I'll read it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, or in the heavenlies, in Christ. That's where they are. That's where all blessings are, in heaven, the heavenlies. That's where Christ is. And we have been blessed in him. That's where we are. We're on earth, but in spirit we are in him. And we've had, as Jesus had a resurrection and an ascension to the Father, we've had that too. We're identified with him and have had a spiritual version of that. We will have a physical version later when Christ returns. But I'm going to read you chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, that kind of death, cut off from God, he has made us alive together with Christ. So there's our resurrection by grace you're saved, saved from death, saved from sin. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We're with him. All spiritual blessings are his. 
They're all in him. And the fact is, I'm in him. And everything he gives, in other words, there are no spiritual blessings available that are not available to me and to Christians. They are given to us all. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Every potential I have, every desire for relationship that is good, everything, every blessing is mine in Christ. I will never be dissatisfied or, or frustrated or, 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 or below what I should be, ultimately in Christ. That's wonderful, isn't it? Two other points, but briefer. Secondly, growing into it, growing into being what it means to be in Christ. Chapter 4, verse 15, I'm going to read this verse, just breaks into the sentence, read Ephesians. It's a wonderful book, but I can't, not time to do that. But, verse 15 of chapter 4, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, into Christ, in all things, which is the head, even Christ, the head of the body, the church of Jesus Christ. In other words, be who you should be. You have the position of being in Christ, but enjoy it. Enter into the reality of it in your everyday experience. Live up to it. Um, here's an example given by our Bible class, a Bible uh, college uh, principal, Mr. Brash, Henry Brash Monsell, spoke of a person who'd inherited a, a state mansion and so on, and he was asked how he got on, how he liked it. Oh, it was wonderful, he said, wonderful. And he, he, he was showing the person he was talking to around his home. And he said, well, is this all you've seen? He was just looking at the gatehouse. He thought that was wonderful. There was the whole mansion in the grounds that he'd not even known was his. It was his, but he wasn't experiencing it. We had a sister, uh, Iris Thorpe, who used to be in the church, and she would often quote something said in the book of Joshua, there is yet much land to be possessed. The land of Israel was given to the Israelites as a possession. It was theirs. It was a gift. Here is your inheritance, if you like, using that term. And these are the bits of it you must particularly conquer. It's yours, but you have to, by faith, go in and enjoy it, conquer it. You can. It's my grace, but you must cooperate with me. And by grace, by my power, you will do that. Or, as it says in the little uh, book, or, uh, if that's right, Prophecy of Obadiah, verse 17, the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions it's their possessions but you've got to use it you know you may have something in your kitchen that would be very helpful to you. be like having a kettle and never using it oh I wish I'd known I had a kettle just plug it in and, and so on uh, that is the idea this is the reason surely for Paul's prayer I, I can't well I won't read it from verses 16 to 23 of chapter 1 where he wants them to understand their position in Christ I'm just going to read you verses 19 and 20 of that prayer he wants their minds to be enlightened that they may understand that they're in Christ this one who's been raised from the dead and and is head over every single thing ruling over everything and we as part of his body obviously are ruling with him he wants people to understand that but I'm going to read you verses 19 and 20 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. He worked this in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenlies above every other name. In other words, all the power of God was demonstrated, exhibited, used in raising a man, the man Christ Jesus, from the dead and exalted him to the highest point. It was wrought in Christ Jesus, and we are in Christ Jesus. And all the power of God 
is there to enable us to enter into what it means to be in Christ. All the blessings that we looked at and more besides that are in this chapter. His power will take us into it. I want you to understand that and to grasp it. Growing into what we actually own and possess in Christ. And thirdly, the point of entry. Entering into that situation where it can be said, I am in Christ. It's very important. You may look at this from not being in that position and think, well, how can I have this? The Bible tells us it can be ours. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verses 12 and a bit of 13. That you should be, or that we should be, to the praise of his glory, who first trusted or hoped in Christ. In Christ. Hoped in him. Put our faith our entire, that the well-being of our souls forever in him. In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And I could read more, but that will do for the moment. Uh, when you put your trust in Christ, you were immediately transferred to be in Christ. You were translated into that wonderful situation so that you were in him you trusted in him you were in him that's how it works when did it happen you trusted when you heard what paul here calls the gospel of your salvation gospel good news when the message of god comes to us it's good news my sin takes me to hell cuts me off from god he's taken that that's good news. How can I be different? How he's risen, sent his Holy Spirit, will keep me and help me and change me and get me there no matter how bad I am. That's good news. The good news of your salvation, saving you from that mess and hopelessness, that sin, that death, saving you to God and purity and, and life. And you see, it's the gospel of, Paul says, it's the gospel of your salvation. When we hear that message, we realise, ah, it's for me. This is the gospel of my salvation, not just a general thing, or for that group of people, or for whatever. It's for me. That's how it comes. That's how they all heard it. That's how it always happens. And it's the word of truth. It is really so. If you trust in Christ, who's died for you, who is here calling you, you will be saved. It's good news to you. It's the gospel of my salvation. And the moment I believe it, trust him, hope in him, and not in, I hope I won't die. You will die. I hope things will improve. They won't. I mean, not ultimately, but when I hope in him, it's a sure hope. Oh, I can do that. It's the word of truth. When I was 19, that was a few years ago, I did that. I remember lying on my bed that same evening. I just was delighted. I was always squeaking with a kind of a delight because I was saved. I was in Christ. I don't think I understood that phrase in Christ, but I was. And just as God said to Noah, come at a certain point, you come into the ark. So it is, come into Christ. There's judgment outside. Doesn't matter what sort of person you are, when you're outside, you're doomed. But by coming in, you have all the benefits, all the wonders of what we have spoken about and much more besides in Christ. Come to Christ. Jesus says, come to me. Come in. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us. Thank you for the moment that comes when we realise this is not just a point, a thing of interest or for some other people, but it's for me. Uh, I realise that, millions have realised that. And we pray for any who may have realised it, maybe for the first time. Would you draw them right in to yourself? Amen. Amen. Now you can do that. You can come to Christ. Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. Forgive me. Wash me. Make me a different person. Help me to follow you. And he will receive you. And you will be in Christ forever. You will. That is the gospel of your salvation. It's the word of truth. The blessing of the almighty, all-knowing, all-wonderful God, Father, Son, 
Holy Spirit. The home of all spiritual blessing. And the one in whom we can have our own home. The blessing of that God rests upon all of us who have hoped in Christ, trusted him, and with God's people everywhere. Amen. Amen. Harvest is coming up and we will be doing a recorded service for it next week on the 18th of October. Where normally we would ask for donations of food for the display and distribution afterwards, this year we can't do this. Instead, we will be making a monetary donation to the church on the farm. If you would like to donate to them, please either transfer the donation to the church, or if you are coming on a Sunday morning, please put it in the donation boxes at the back and mark it for the church on the farm. In our Wednesday Zoom meeting, we will be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. Lastly, having lost his phone two Sundays ago, Paul now has a new one. If you've tried to contact him during this time, do please message him now. Uh, include who you are as he has lost most of his contacts.